Welcome to AI Nerd, AI with Attitude interview with, today I have with me, Sudzy Monchik, arguably, not in my mind, but arguably with others, the uh, best racquetball player ever to live on this planet. Um, Sudzy, thank you so much for uh, your time today. How are you? I'm great, Tom. Thanks for having me to AI Nerd. This is exciting. I've never been on an AI Nerd show, so I'm looking forward to this. That's fair. I mean, you, 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 uh, you know, the, for the 32 people that are going to watch this, they're going to really appreciate the world. <laughs> the 30, world best. 33. I'm definitely going to have my daughter watch it. She's okay, 30. And, and we'll put it on the YouTube for her. Well, you know, I, I appreciate it. Now, I know who you are. We've known each other for a number of years. Uh, but, you know, for the people that are going to watch this, they're like, who is Sedzi Manchik? <laughs> Please uh, tell me. Tell, tell us who you are. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a kid from New York that picked up a racket at an early age and had some success. And, you know, but that's who I am. I'm, I'm a racquetball player, but, you know, somebody that right now I'm definitely focused on inspiring and motivating people in totally all different facets of life. You're a, you're a racquetball player. And how, I, I don't know this. I mean, I don't know the story, but if, I mean, I know the story. Others don't know the story. I don't know how you picked up a racket first time. I guess let's start with the name. Sudsy is not your given name. Tell Correct. me how you got the name. Sudsy. Yeah. So actually my given name, which I'm pretty sure you know, is Walter. Yeah. And not many people know that. I mean, to the point where if I walked down the street and somebody said, hey, Walter, I really wouldn't even turn around. So when I was about 10 months old and, you know, kids are starting to learn to walk and I'm, I'm like holding on to furniture. And my dad, this big uh, New York City police sergeant is sitting there with his newspaper. So he's obviously not watching me because back then our parents didn't really watch us. So I'm walking around and he has like a, a glass of beer, um, you know, sitting on the table. And he says, he notices after about 30 seconds, which probably was about three hours of not noticing where his 10 month old was, he goes, I don't, I don't hear my son. So he says, he takes the newspaper and he just kind of looks over like this. And there I am at this table, just a foot away from him, but I have this beer all over my face and everything, you know, the suds from the beer. And he, the way he tells it, Tom, he looks at me, he goes, sudsy. And that was it. And he goes back to reading his paper. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, uh. The, uh, I think Sudsy's better than Walter. It's like almost the uh, Eldrick to Tiger move. I'm going to give you credit for that. You know what? Thank you. Yeah, my name was supposed to be Christopher because I was born on Christopher Columbus Day. But dad being the big dad's like, nope, he's going to be a junior. So <laughs> oh, Walter. Walter Jr. Well, how did you uh, first pick up a racket? I actually don't know that. Like, you were like really young. I think you won like a, the U.S. Open when you were age six. So <laughs> <laughs> No. Actually, that's about the first time I picked up the racket when I was about six years old. So my best friend growing up, Jason Menino, who, you know, also one of the greatest racquetball players of all time, uh, he would just, he was playing earlier. He started playing when he was about two or three years old and we were super, well, you know, a racket in hand and going on the court and we were super competitive and we played everything. And about six, seven years old, my dad and his dad were business partners in a racquetball club. And Jason, who had been playing for a long time, you know, first introduced me to racquetball. He said, come on, we're going to go play racquetball at my parents' club. I'm like, what? And I'm about six or seven, and uh, he's kicking my ass. I mean, he's kicking my ass all over the place, and we're super competitive, you know, getting on the court and hitting balls all over the place, and I don't know where it's going to bounce. I don't know what to do. And uh, at, at the end of the day, that was my motivation at that age to get better. It just started with wanting to beat him. That was all I wanted to do was beat Jason, and the rest is history. I mean, I've seen you guys do some incredibly knockout matches just throughout juniors and up through pro. And I, I think you ended up getting the better of them long term, but uh, <laughs> we'll get into that in a bit too. Uh, what was your first win in racquetball? Uh, my first one was probably a local tournament in, in like the New York, New Jersey area. Uh, but the first big one was the eight and under junior nationals in Fishkill, New York. Yeah. I beat Craig Sizz from Florida in the finals. My word. Well, in your last win, well, just fast forward, wasn't it just a, wasn't too long ago, actually, a few months? Yeah, February 2020, believe it or not, right before that COVID thing or virus thing hit, uh, we played the U.S. national doubles in Arizona, and my partner, Alex Land, and I won, and currently I'm on Team USA again. Again, that's crazy. Age 46, I did, I told you your age, I just think you recently had a birthday, so happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're uh, from New York, Staten Island. You, you won everything and, you know, maybe just take, take me, give me the, the 50,000 foot flyby Concord version of your career. Cause I, I, I know in like 2006 or so, you know, 
you got sidelined, like in the middle of just absolutely winning everything, you're, you're back. And so Timmy, just give me a, the journey and, and maybe talk about, you know, not only just, just how you felt, like, you know, your, your mental game was incredibly good. And, and how did that affect you? And just, just talk about it. Cause I think it's, an, I mean, it's going to be an incredible story. I, I've never actually heard it just pieces. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, one thing I always say about athletes is that physically 100% of the time, we're never 100%. And, you know, growing up playing all sports, constantly competing, there's always aches and pains and, you know, things that are bothering or lingering and you just shake them off, you know, and you say, ah, it's just an injury or I'm sore or this or that. And, you know, I played my amateur career and, and did okay, did pretty good in, in, for, in USA racquetballs events and all that stuff. And right out of there, instead of playing a lot of international competitions and teams, I signed a pro contract when I was 19 years old. So I went and played professionally right away. And again, you know, I had some back issues, but, you know, racquetball is vicious on the body. It's a high impact sport. Uh, as you know, we're, you know, we're diving all over the place, the torque, the turning, and no matter how great a shape you're in, you just can't hide from injuries sometimes. And, you know, I always had this, this back thing that I always thought was just a back thing, you know, everybody's back hurts. Or, and then one day I had to forfeit out of the U.S. Open because I, I couldn't stand. I literally couldn't stand up. I had to lay down flat on my back. And I went to the doctor and the, the, I'll never forget this, Tom, like it was eerie at the moment because as the doctor's reading the x-rays in the CAT scan, he looks over at me like over his shoulder, like with his face of, oh my goodness, you know, I can't believe this. And he actually said those words. He said, I can't believe what you've done in your career with what you have. And he diagnosed me with spondylolisthesis. Yeah, look that one up. AI nerd can definitely look that one up. I will let an AI pronounce that for me. That's yeah, funny. yeah. So I can never spondylolis thesis. So yeah, it's where the disc slips. And, and once that happens, the muscles in your back engage and they lock up because it, it's sending a message to your brain that your spine isn't stable. So, so visually, they, your, your, your body thinks that your spine is going like this. So the body does what it's supposed to and all the back muscles lock. And they engage like this. So they keep you tight. So you can't do anything. It's not like you can, you're, you're, you're almost immobile. And as I got older, it progressively got worse and worse. And they told me, they said, if you want to continue to play professionally, you know, you're going to need surgery, which would be two rods along your spine. And I said, there's no chance I'm doing that. And, um, you know, so it was a little rocky. I broke my foot in 2001 uh, called the Jones fracture, which is a common fracture amongst athletes in the foot area it's the fifth metatarsal so if this is your foot it's right about here and uh, then I broke it again so I broke that twice then I got the screw in that foot but yeah I was plagued with a couple of injuries you know mentally I never let it beat me up uh, it was more of a challenge and I looked at it like hey you know what if somebody or something wants to challenge me well then let's have at it and see how we do you know and then just recently coming back to play competitively uh, the first tournament I played professionally was in 2017 and that was in over 12 years and that was that's a pretty good story with how I wound up entering the 2017 U.S. Open. Yeah I, I, thanks for sure that it's, it's I, I mean I can't imagine emotionally you know you, you know it's 2005 it, it was a 2006 you dropped out of the Open is that correct? Yeah so that that's actually when I was diagnosed with it and there was a couple of years before that that I, I had these lingering injuries like I broke my foot I broke it again and uh, yeah, I was, I had won my first two rounds and in the final, literally the final point match point, it was 10 zero. We used to play three out of five to 11. I was playing Javier Moreno, who I know, you know, and <laughs> I had match cool. point and a ball came around and I jumped up and j came back down. And as soon as I landed, I just felt the back go. I said, that's it. I'm, I'm literally done. I don't know what to do. So I wound up getting in the box. I like hit, I just hit a lob serve just to get over the line. He skips it. Oh, he, he could have went to the ceiling. He could have, and he would have beat me three in a row or, or I would have had to forfeit. So I win, go to the next round. Now I'm in the round of 16s. This is 2006, like you said, and it's against Alvaro Beltran. But prior to the match, I had to go to a doctor and have him see me. That's not where I was diagnosed, but he had, a, he had an idea of what was going on. He tells me, go to the club, go warm up, see how you feel. I go to the club. I couldn't stand. I, I go to bounce a ball and I go like this and I drop to my knees. So anyway, I forfeit to Alvaro. That was in the round of 16s. I obviously couldn't play the match. And I saw the doctor that was there in Memphis that night. And I said, doc, why, 
you know, what were you thinking? He goes, Sudsy, I knew you couldn't play. He goes, but I didn't want to tell you that. And around the 16s of the U.S. Open, and here you are, you're in great shape, you're ready to win another one, and blah blah blah. And 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 that was it. And then that's when I went to New York. I flew home to New York. That's where they diagnosed me. Yeah, and that was the end of it because it was the, that launched Kane. I think he won that year, if I remember right. <laughs> that was that, that was it. I was yeah. yeah, I was that was that that one took a lot out of me. And you were still living in the states at this point, correct? Yeah, I was living in New York. Yep, yep. And that was 2006. And then the next U.S. Open I competed was 2017 because of uh, my, my wife. I, m- I remember seeing, uh, we'll get to how you get to Ecuador. So that's an interesting step in, in the career for sure. I, I think it's amazing you're down there and you've made a life and home there, which is even, you know, uh, envious even because, you know, I, I'm married to somebody from another country as well. Uh, and we, you know, it's, you know, you can dream in one hand and just go do it on the other. Right. And then you, you wouldn't, you went to go do it. But it's uh, 2017. I remember seeing the Facebook fo- post come up. So I was interested, sitting on a ball. Yeah. <laughs> You're like 250 pounds. No, <laughs> <laughs> Probably about two and a quarter at my max. <laughs> well, we've all been there. Some of us are still working through that. But uh, it's, it's always nice in your 40s. And you're like, hey, I'm in better shape now than I was in my 20s, right? And it, where was the 30s? We're all, we all got big in our 30s. Just a, let's all, all racquetball players, Menino, all of them got big in the 30s. Um, <laughs> but uh, t- take me through that. So, you know, you, you go from 2006 and, and you're figuring it out. What's the next 11 years till you return? I mean, you know, what was the indicator to say, I'm doing this again? So maybe give me, I, I know we're going decade at a time, but you really are a fascinating athlete and human. And you've, you've uh, if I remember as a kid, the cockiest now, you were the second cockiest kid. Jason Menino was the cockiest kid. Confidence, confidence. There's a big difference. <laughs> there was confidence. Maybe the youth, it was a little more on the cockiest side. Maybe. <laughs> but, Slightly. But the confidence was certainly, and it was certainly earned. Um, Nothing funnier than watching you and me, Nino, by the way, have a, have a match like you're just back home in New York. And it was just like so much trash talking. <laughs> it's like you feel like you're about to go fisticuffs. But anyway, uh, fast forward, 2006, you get the news. You're, you're laid up. You're in New York. Take me through like the next part. This is like the next, you know, part of your life. Like what happens? How do you make the transition? Yeah. So, I mean, at that time, you know, my son was six at the time. And honestly, it really enabled me to focus and lock in on coaching him. He, he was a really successful basketball, uh, baseball player and a good, good basketball player, good athlete in general, and a, excuse me, and a great student. But it really enabled me to focus my attention and energy, you know, into being able to give him the mental strength and conditioning and knowledge that I know he was going to need as he, you know, progressed through life. So from six to about 15, 16, you know, we were always together and uh, just trying to do the best I could to mold him into being a champion, yeah. not only in a field, but, you know, off the court and in life in general. Let, let me ask a question before you kind of continue. What were you, since the mental game, so any athlete I've seen, like, you know, it's usually not, once you, you know, if you think about racquetball to basketball to golf, it, once you're physically able to do the sport and do it well and repeat whatever you need to do, the difference is, in, is between left ear and right ear. And the same thing has to do with in, in success in business or anything else. What do you, what do you teach a six-year-old to age 11 to become mentally tough? Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of the things, there's no doubt because any lesson that I would go through with him or anything that I was, whenever I was speaking or, or trying to show him something, it wasn't just about sport. You know, like for me, sport is life. You know, it's a big competition. It just is. But, you know, to, to why people, we're wired, right? Like as individuals, we're wired. We come wired a certain way. Um, And then what makes a good coach or a good business leader or a business owner or a good teacher, you know, is you have to recognize that. And and what I found when I was coaching team sports with my son, which I really enjoyed, I may have 12 kids, kids, six to 10, 11, 12 years old sitting in front of me. And I may say one thing, but they're processing it 10, 11, 12 different ways. And then what makes you good and successful in your communication to get the most and maximize those kids and make sure they're getting it is to speak it to them individually and so that they understand and now they can get it, absorb it, and then they can use it to the best of their ability. Because let's face it, you have kids that are really good, really bad. They have different home lives. They have different, you know, education levels. They have different attention spans. I mean, they have, you know, so you have to figure out a way as a business owner or as an athlete, how to communicate that into the person that you're trying to maximize their potential and abilities. You know, what I found success, what worked for me, for my son was I always kept it very, very real, but very real at that level and age. 
I wasn't a big, oh my God, you did so great, Derek. You know, I'm so proud of you when he was awful. You know, I would ask him things maybe that were positive. Hey, buddy, what do you think you could have done better? You know, or, or I, I'll never forget. There was a time where he was literally 11 years old. And I'm kind of in the background. I have friends that are major league baseball players. And I would ask them, I'm like, you know, all-stars and World Series champs. I'm like, you know, what do you do when you go watch it? a game with your kid in Little League. I said, because obviously it must be difficult for you knowing what you've gone through, your experiences, and you hear these dads and coaches and they're telling you someone to do. And, and I'll never forget a buddy of mine, Steve Avery, he played for the Braves. He goes, Suds, I get a six pack, I go sit in right field and I don't say a word. He goes, and then afterwards, you know, not always the car ride home parents, you know, we give that, you gotta pick and choose and know, because listen, we're athletes, we're human beings. There's times we don't want to speak. There's times we don't want to listen. So you need to identify that and that's okay. And, and with Derek, it was always very real. Um, I, like I said, there was a time where he said to me, you know, I don't understand. How come I'm not batting third and why am I not the number one pitcher in the rotation? And there's no doubt at the time, I, I remember I agreed with him. He was like the number two pitcher and batting like five. And, but I agreed with him, but I didn't say, oh, I agree with you. Let's go talk to the coach. No, I actually said, you know what? Go do everything in your power to be so much better that he has no choice but to put you there. You know, and, and, and he did. Kept just working hard and, you know, that's what he did. I was always trying to motivate and push him. But that's another thing, you know, Tom, AI nerd and anybody, you know, you have to find what motivates and inspires you. I'm not motivated and inspired by accolades and titles anymore. You know, we just talked about the title I won in February 2020. It wasn't because I woke up one day and said, I, I want another medal. I want to win. I want to be on Team it, USA. It did, it did have to feel good, though, to get one more. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but it felt it. It does, but it felt good, honestly, for for the reason why I was doing it at right. the, at that moment. You know, it was there was a time, yeah, that there was no doubt. I wanted medals and awards and money and fame and you know popularity. And and over the years, recently, it's not about that. It's it's I'm totally inspired and motivated by different things, and and that's what you, as a business leader or a coach. Like find the things that push those buttons and inspire and motivate because it's not always like, look, you're going to win a medal. Sometimes right. a lot of other details that you have to identify. You, you bring up an interesting point. It's so, you know, you had a hiatus due to injury. It's, it's interesting if you had the same mentality, you know, you, you, you know, the old giveaway, the, the wisdom, right? I mean, no, one, no one wants it, right? So, but if you could go back, you know, career 30s uninjured with that mindset, imagine, do you think you, you, that's the better mindset from uh just overall accomplishment winning or is is the mindset you had at 2004 in the middle of your, your absolute prime winning mindset more appropriate for winning in sport yeah I think it's different I think that you know there's no doubt you know my mind is molded now it's become like an armored mind um you know where David Goggins says I don't know if you've ever heard of David Goggins but great book by the way can't hurt me so you know my mind is like an armored mind now where you can't penetrate it. There's nothing you can do. And that takes time. You know, that takes failures and success, but understanding how and why those things happened. And I think when you're younger, you know, in the moment, you're just doing things. Things are just happening and you can't really explain it or articulate. And there's a lot of great champions or successful business people in life. They can't explain or articulate or communicate how or why they did what they're doing or what they did in the past even. But for me, it was like, I call it, Usually I call it the, uh, the water bottle theory. So if you put something really close to your face, right? Like that, you can see this, right, Tom? You see this as a cup. I do. So that was me in my career, my prime. Now, as the time went, it just got much more clear. The clarity was crystal and it, I understood what I was doing and why and how. But had you asked me during my prime, I probably couldn't explain exactly every little detail what I was doing. Now I can. And, and I think that that's, you know, it's important. And that's where I love to share that wisdom and knowledge. You know, that's a great point. Cause it's, it's the, uh, you know, you can't see the trees amongst the forest kind of analysis because you're in the middle of it and that's where it is. And I mean, I'll, I'll look back, you know, I, I played in juniors, not, you know, not nearly obviously to your level, but I was in it. I think I know for sure. I love the, the friendships and the travel and the fun. I was more concerned about having fun than winning. I didn't care. Honestly. I, mean, I wanted to win. But you I know, were fun. You were fun. <laughs> but I, that's what I wanted to do. And I go, if I really look bad, and honestly, I, that's why I enjoyed going. You know, you always get bummed and you lose and you shouldn't. And you get happy when you win and you have a moment of 
focus but since i'm all over the map as a you know you talk about being wired um you know there's a lot of people out there not just like myself but just who have different motivations in the context of something else so uh for me it was racquetball and for others it might be a, a tennis it might be reading a book it may be doing podcasts whatever it is it, it, it's um you can always improve by having a different perspective and applying it and just trying it. And I think, you know, that's something you don't get until you're older and realize you should have done that. And, you know, if, if I look at, you know, you, where you're gone now and, you know, you, maybe you could tell the little bit of the story of, so you're in the middle of this transition from uh, what you were, you know, all-star athlete chasing it, getting the accolades, let's, let's win it, uh, you know, without injury in my mind, mathematically, I believe you would, be the all-time winningest racquetball player on pro tour because a lot of the wins that uh cliff and kane had gotten after you would have had you would have taken and so there's a there's a math you know if we if i can add a little uh Maybe. little technology Maybe. and science into it there's no there's no way well confidence builds wins and if there's other people that are taking away some of the wins and confidence you don't win as much it's just that's how it works and i, I think arguably that would have been uh man if you three all in your prime going at once but you were all three in it would have been just that would have taken – I actually think that could have uh, transformed the sport a bit, too. I think there's enough personality between the three of you to, uh, to have carried out a reality show uh, at that time. It's where we're talking about that. But, yeah, definitely. I mean, we're all different types, but all – you know, those two guys are obviously incredible. Thank you for, for what you're saying. But, you know, who knows? You never know, right? Well, you never know. But, you know, as you make that transition, it, it was gone, right? And so you uh, – how did you end up – let's go to this. How do you end up in Ecuador? I – it, was so, it was it the cold summers? No, 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 not at all. So, so in two, January two thousand fifteen, my wife, um, she's the the most decorated best player in the history of this country, in the history of Ecuador. And Veronica was playing a match actually against Paola Longoria from Mexico, who's the all time best women's player. And I was there saying hello to Paola and Fran Davis, and she was playing Veronica. And Veronica, the match is over and you know, I really watched her and said, wow, this, this girl could be the best in the world, meaning Veronica. And that was it. And then we kind of talked like a week later or so. And she said that Ecuador was looking for a national team coach and, you know, they pay really well. And I, we just started kind of communicating. And then September, 2015, um, I moved down here and, you know, because I had to be all in to do it. So, so first they came to New York, their team, and I trained them for six weeks prior to the Pan American Games, which was in July 2015 in Toronto. And they had the best results they ever had. And they were all, they just loved it. And they loved the approach. They loved my, my mental approach, uh, the way we went about it, because it wasn't the same old X's and O's, oh, do this and go hit a thousand down the lines. It was, it was the fine details that they've never, never been part of. And they wanted me full time. But for me to be full time, I actually had to live down here. And September 2015, I came down, and, and that was it. Man, you married for a green card down there. Just admit it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I did. I think I just wanted the passport. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, we married July 2017 because I, I was previously married. And, um, and it's been just great. You know, I haven't looked back, and Ecuador is incredible. The, the country is great. People are amazing. And no doubt it's made me a better person. You, uh, you have a little one now, I hear. Yes. Two. Actually, actually, two little ones. So, two, yeah. How how has that reshaped your world to be like? Not yeah, one. A, yeah. one. One could be an accident. Two is intentional. So. You know, two, <laughs> two is intentional, and so is the fact that we won't have a third. That's intentional. <laughs> that was snip, snip, burn, burn, <laughs> and, and you're done. <laughs> so, yeah, as AI would say, we disconnected. So, we, it, you know, uh, two and two years and seven months is our daughter Juliana, and Mateo is six months. And yeah, it definitely keeps the, the energy going. You know, a buddy of mine said to me, funny, um, he just, one day we're just talking. He goes, so what's it like changing diapers again? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it was, it's different. It's, it's, def it's the same thing, just different time. <laughs> it's the same shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It is. Still <laughs> no. smells. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I, I have a, I've seen a, surge, a resurgence of racquetball, maybe just because I've, I've gotten, I don't play anymore because every time I do, I get injured. I, I can only think like an 18-year-old with a 40 something year old body and I think better, but am I, I mean, there's the ball and I'm like, there, there it goes. And it just, <laughs> I, I just forget it. Um, 
you play anything else? You playing three wall? You playing you playing pickleball? I, you do anything good like that? I'll do it all. You know, I love to compete. Uh, I'm actually looking outside because you know I should be golfing right now. Right. Uh, my wife and I <laughs> play tennis. We we do everything. Yeah, we we compete. You know, whatever it is. I was just in Vegas for the outdoor event. That was cool. But yeah, I like to. You know, one of the things about speaking of wiring, the only one of the things that's tough and difficult though is when you're wired to want to win or mm. wired to want to compete you just want to always be better. So like, you know, yesterday I'm playing golf and if I'm not shooting like Dustin Johnson at the masters or tiger, I'm disappointed. And I, and you know, it's just not the way it is. Well, let's be fair. I can easily get a 10 on a par three, but I cannot, <laughs> right, yeah. easily, I cannot easily follow it up with five birdies. Unbeli- <laughs> un- unreal. Yeah. I mean, just tiger esque. Right. Uh, the, you know, so you're, you're doing some coaching still. Uh, I, I still think, you know, like the kind of coaching you can do for business, and, and not just sport. I mean, if I think of like, I had a kid who's just trying to get better at a sport, any sport, uh, hiring you for a coach would be a no brainer. And, and, and if people couldn't see the, the, the absolute value of taking any sport and training for it and the loss of, of being in your prime and getting out of it and then getting back in and winning again, it, it should not only prove that how you think around a court and around business, because you're one of the few people who's ever monetized a sport that very few people actually know you can monetize, which is racquetball. Um, I, w- I mean, I, I, you are doing these types of coaching, correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm doing, you know, all sorts of coaching, not just racquetball, uh, definitely, you know, I'm a certified life coach too, Tom. So, you know, and I, and, I, and I took that course, honestly, that just helped me with, you know, because I like to absorb and gain knowledge. You know, a lot of people just think I was gifted and somebody touched me and said, you're the best player in the world. And I'm, no, I actually work pretty hard. So, yeah. you know, I, I do enjoy that. And, and definitely, no matter what sport it is, business, life, relationships. My intention, my goal is to just maximize you. I want you to be better in whatever it is that you do. You know, in the X's and O's and the technical stuff and all the sports, I mean, there's all these sports specific training, man. Open it up, let your kids, let your your business partners experience and do other things. You know, one thing that's very unique about my coaching style, specifically in racquetball, is if I'm coaching you per se, um, and you're like, well, I wanna go work with coach A, you know what I say? go, go, you should, you know, where other coaches like, no, you can't go anywhere. Don't do anything. I'm like, no, no, you should go open up that brain and see, see what it's like and, and try to get as much info from, from different areas as you can. But yeah, for me, you know, like my, I, like people always say like, what's your favorite type of person or individual to coach? I just want to work with somebody that wants to be better. I don't care if it's in a racquetball court. I don't care if it's in life, in school, you know, and, uh, and hopefully I can help you do that. And if not, and if I can't help you, I'll motivate and inspire you to do that for sure. It, it would be interesting. Uh, the, the, the Sudsy one week business class where you spend two few hours a day on a racquetball court, regardless you're not a player or not. Sure. You take those exact same lessons. And they go, what the hell do you do in your business and how do you apply that exactly to your, like the parallels of it? Because it's, I mean, to be successful in anything, it's one and the same from a discipline execution piece. Mm-hmm. No, no question about that. There is, what is it you want to go get? There's some kind of strategy you're going to be involved. Um, and, and, and like someone who maybe has never played racquetball, wh- how do you start off the best you possibly can? And, and, and you mix those two. Th- I think it'd be a fun week with you to do that. It's like, hey, we're going to go play. I'm going to break all that down. Then we're going to talk about what you do and what the hell you're trying to accomplish and how you're thinking about it. Um, and that's the life coach, business coach side of it but applied from a, from a world champion. So Yeah, let's, I, let's set it up. I'm, I'm down with that. But Tom, the one thing you left out, which – is about racquetball and why I think it's super important in life is racquetball, as you know, is an individual sport, right? So when we're out there and we're competing, again, whether you're trying to be the CEO of your company or, or, or the principal at your school, or you want to be the best baseball player, you know, it doesn't matter. It's you as an individual. And I preach accountability, responsibility. You don't like where you're at. It's on you. You're not pointing fingers at anybody else. You can go be better. You can make the decision and do what you want to do. It's up to you. You don't like how you feel today? Well, wake up tomorrow and do everything different than what you did today. And, you know, something about racquetball too, when you play an individual sport or you're an individual athlete, it makes you a better team player. Because in racquetball, I know that when I'm in the court and it's me against you, I'm the only one that can, can beat you, right? Right. But when there's a team of, say, you're in basketball and it's five or football and 11 or soccer and it's 12 or whatever it is, you know, there's too much of, oh, well, Tom didn't play good today or Mary did this. When it's racquetball and it's one-on-one, I look in the mirror and I go, well, Sudsy, you could have been better at this. 
You need to get better at that. And, and that goes directly with life. If you don't like where you're waking up and you don't like the desk you're sitting at, whatever it may be at today, you can make the difference. And this isn't smoke and mirrors. This is real life. You know, I was 50 pounds heavier than this when I took my little hiatus from racquetball for a while. And I woke up one day and said, yeah, I did this. And guess what? I don't like it anymore. So I'm going to make a change. I'll give and you $5 right now to show me a picture of fat Sudsy. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will Venmo you right now. Let me, oh, let me pull it up. I'll get my Venmo out. Here we go. Did you say 50 or five? Five. It's just five. It's just five for the 50. So, That's all it's worth. So, yeah, I have this. And, and, and it's got to be shirtless, suds. I don't have a shirtless. <laughs> you don't take a lot of shirtless photos when you're 50. I, away, I think that doesn't happen. Those, those were too repulsive, but I will find you. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, right now I'm 170. I'm kidding. 170? I'm going to show you the picture. I'm 170, but at my peak yeah. of – um gluttonous behaviors i was at two and a quarter and it was not good is that is it was that in metric or two and a quarter oh pounds I, would, I was pounds buddy you know it's funny in, we're completely off topic excuse me to, to the 30 <laughs> people watching but i'm trying to i'm trying to actually find you a know, picture. this might be 34 people now this is pretty um yeah i get it i went through my 30s i think i was a, a good 252 the day i got married so I don't know why my wife married me. Yeah, but you're much taller than me. I'm only yeah, five. I'm only that. five nine. Do the math. Ooh. Yeah. I definitely want to see chunky sudsy. Oh, it's not chunky. It's yeah, that's being nice. I Did you ever measure it. chins? Like, uh, oh, I'm at three chins. Maybe I should do something about that. Like, I had a solid two. Yeah. Here's yeah. one for you. Oh, here we go. You guys can see that. Let me, let me be quiet and focus on that one second here. Click it over. Oh, that's not you. That's me. Oh, let me let me pin that. Oh, let's get that bigger. My word. I wouldn't even recognize you. You're not the only one. There was two of me there. I might have one more, which you'll like, because it was um, July 2015 when I coached Team Ecuador at the Pan Am Games versus uh, the first time I got back on Team USA. And that was – that's pretty impressive, too, because it's a side-by-side. -side. You know what? No, I actually, look, though, I actually talk about that. So how do you, you know, what's the day? Because I've been there, and I'd love to hear your story. What is the day when you wake up and you're like, no more of this? You I know, mean, it's, I, I think that's a little bit overhyped because that just doesn't work. You know, that's another thing. I don't like to set goals for people. Like, I'm not going to take you and say, all right, we're going to lose 50 pounds. Hey, just lose one. All right. And don't even look at it as I'm going to lose one. Just make better choices, better decisions. There's a guy that's on Facebook who's a big racquetball player and fan. Now, this guy is, was 350 pounds. No joke. I'll give it to you offline. It's uh, Norm, right? It is Norm. Norm and, yeah, yeah. and true story, he kind of messaged me something. All right, here you go, buddy. This one's a good one. I mean, that's how I found his feed because I saw you commenting. No way. I would never have picked you out on the left, ever. Yep, that's me. I would, I would have walked right by you a hundred times. That's me in the black. Now, if so, you had put racquetball glasses on, I would have I, I, – clearly. It's, uh, so, no, so, so Norm, you know, we're talking, and he's 350 pounds, super unhealthy. He's always posting these pictures of, of what he's eating. You know, he's eating fried foods and drinking beers and eating, you know, French fries, potato chips, and just bad choices, right? So I didn't say – and he didn't say to me, hey, I want to lose a bunch of weight. I didn't say that at all. I, literally, I said, just go make better choices. That's all. He's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what'd you eat today? Uh, three cheeseburgers, seven beers. I'm like, so I have two and a half cheeseburgers. You know, how many French fries did you have? A uh, hundred. Have 75. Have 80. Just a little bit better choices. He's lost over 50 pounds. In yeah. a couple, and, and really, what happens, Tom, is that your brain gets tricked and conditioned into... Now I don't like the way I feel. So to your question, when you, those pictures of, of, of me there, you know, yeah, that was as an elite professional athlete, you know, and I just was making bad decisions. And I, and I just decided I'm just going to make some better decisions, but I'm not going to go cold turkey because that's when people set themselves up for failure. You can't, if you're sitting watching AI Nerd right now and, you know, you're in the office and go, I want to be the CEO tomorrow. It's not going to happen. It's not, I promise. Okay. Baby steps. Just make good choices. Get in, get in a little earlier, 
leave a little later, be recognized maybe, just do something different. You know, do something different that you're not doing today as to why you are where you are now. And I always say that to athletes, Tom. You know what I love? I love this. And you get it in the business world too. You know, well, I didn't like the results I had, but, but what? What are you doing? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> I love that. You know, especially with social media today, right, Tom? You see it all the time. You know, well, I went to, you know, Ecuador. I had the tournament. I didn't get the results I hoped for, so I'm going to keep working hard. Okay. So what are you going to do different? Well, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to – good luck with that. Yep. And it's, uh, it, it's great points. I mean, I, like I said, I think, you know, there's no, I gotta tell you, I get solicited a lot for life coaches and other things online. And I usually talk to people and see if there's something unique there, but what's always missing is, is a perspective of, of a completely different Avenue. And, and what I, I, what I think you'd be fantastic at and as a shameless plug, which I do every, every one of these is, you know, the fact that you have succeeded in a completely different parallel and can apply that and you figured out, not everyone can do this, but you know, there's a lot of athletes who can't make that they couldn't teach to save their life. But you've done that, you know. You've coached. You've done this. I think, I think you got a lot to offer there. Says, and I don't even think you've probably even reached truly your full potential of what you're going to get to do in your own life um, uh, to offer to, to people to help. I, I really think you've got a. That's a stepping stone. The whole rack is a stepping stone to something you were probably more meant to do. I I, pre I really do appreciate that, Tom. Because it, I mean honestly, it too. I, 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 I appreciate that. There, there. You know, for me, I, I do. That's what I. That's why I go now like that's what I want to do whether so whoever's watching this or anybody listening or anybody I come in contact with I truly do I, I just want to help make them better and maximize their abilities in whatever it is they do in life you know and and it's not because I'm better or smarter not at all it's because I have failed and succeeded in all of these different things you know and and I really that's what drives me like it's more important for me now to see you or, or somebody do better than it is even for me. Like, it's not about me anymore. It was, there was a time where it was me, me, me. And there's no doubt now it's about everybody else, you know. That's fantastic. So, how, I mean, sudsymanchik.com, what's the, uh, how do they get a hold of you? I think that's the one. Yeah, you, you, can, you can go to Uh You can also definitely download my app, you know, whether you like racquetball or not, check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, Instagram and Twitter is at sudsym. Um, you know, and, and yeah, if you're interested in doing something together, whether it's on the court, off the court, feel free. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I'll, I really appreciate the time. Obviously we've got to catch up more often. Um, I, I know you're, you're, uh, you're well-traveled. So if you ever, if you ever, well, you're actually up here in Atlanta, I believe in January. So I will make sure I'm going to come over and see you given that COVID mm -hmm. doesn't murder the tournament. Um, I will come up and see you over there. I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. Hey, take care. Thank you so much. Sudsy Monchick, everybody. Give me a round of applause, all 33 of you. Just a little round, but thank you. Thank Cheers. you.